and welcome to the National Museums of Kenya. Kenya is actually home to quite a number of museums and right here we are at the Nairobi National Museum which is a flagship of the, of the National Museums of Kenya set up in 1929. And this is actually, the Nairobi National Museum is actually a walking distance from the city center and it possesses some of the iconic uh, collections of Kenya's history, nature, culture, and contemporary art. So today particularly, we are going to be speaking to a curator, specifically in the uh, natural science department and we're going to learn much more about the preservation of mammals in the country. Come with me. My name is Bernard Agwanda. I work for National Museums of Kenya as a research scientist and the curator of mammals. Um, where we are is National Museums of Kenya and at the center of collections for mammals. The National Museums of Kenya is in charge of uh, collections of historical, cultural, and scientific value. And so this is just one part of functions of the museums where we're standing. Eighty percent of what you see here are specimens in chemical called ethanol to preserve them forever, and uh, most of them are collected by myself because of the my research program from two thousand and six till to date is to understand what mammals we have in Kenya, where do they are, and what are the pathogens, virus or bacteria that they have that could be of medical importance oh, wow. and that's why they're in this format. Of course, we also do the same for the dry skins you see over there. And uh, we have controlled collection of uh, dry skins of large mammals. But this is still done a little bit with precaution to answer those important questions for biomedical as well as uh, food security questions. So, yeah, so you can see here, Agwanda. Yes, and this is my kingdom. Yeah. My oldest collection is uh, 1999. 1999? Yes. I was a student that time, but I was already. Uh, working closely with the National Museums of Kenya. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, yeah I do. It's um, a rodent which is only found in Taita Hills. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But overall, mammals here, the oldest is, 2000, is, is uh, 1909. 1909. Yeah, meaning we have celebrated our centenary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Over Before century. we even got independence. Of course. Um, 1909, even Nairobi was not properly Nairobi. I think we were operating from from uh, Machakos as the headquarters at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what like, has been one of your most memorable experience in the tenure of your work here? Uh, several of them, but one outstanding one is working in um, a place which is full of terrorists and tend to get the important science out. And I'm glad that we were able to describe a new species for science, which I'll show you back in my office. We have named it after Mandela because the, the terrorism issue was borrowed from neighboring countries, which is struggling to have a proper governance. And peace and proper governance is one of the things that uh, Mandela fought for many years, not just in South Africa, for the entire continent. And so we attributed this to his name as a honor for, for that. So we've named it after Mandela. So that to me is outstanding. We're working very hard, but we were surrounded by terrorists and very many security agents who are not able to give us protection because we were unable also to follow the procedures of the security of the country. Yeah. So to me, that was challenging, but thrilling because the results were rewarding. We, we was actually sleeping under the tree the same way that's, you can see uh, the, the chimp is sitting under the under my tongue. So we were sitting under the tree. Each night we have to retire that way because there was no home. We could not establish camps because of the security issues and so forth and so on. 
So that's one of the one out of many outstanding and exciting aspects of my work. If you remember each one of them has got a number and this number takes you to the data where it was collected, when it was it collected, was it a male or a female, what was its weight, what was the tail length and so forth and so on. So if you want to understand if the monkey's tail are shortening or lengthening with time, mm. then we are able to tell. Then we say from 1909 to 1920, they were longer this way in this area, but from this time envelope to that envelope, they are getting shorter. And then now they started elongating again and so forth and so on. So each collection has got a unique way of answering our questions. It could be those questions that don't have already relevance to our life, but there are certain questions that can be brought to answer food security issues, public health issues, and hope I'll be able to explain for you some of the public health issues. Just right next to us is a freezer where we keep the organs of these animals. And it's, di it's, it's deep, literally, it freezes to minus 80. And therefore, if there's a virus there, that virus is, is, is preserved for that long. So we can answer questions of if, for instance, COVID-19 virus actually came from our pangolin and we have pangolins and we have got the organs here or blood, then we can be able to screen and say, well, for those that we've been able to collect over the years in Kenya, in this particular area, they are COVID-19 free. Or this one has got a virus that is related to COVID, but not actually COVID. And we do that for the bats too, because bats have also been implicated. And we've been able to see that certain bats in our environment have got virus that are similar to um, coronavirus that we know are found in human beings. Similar, but not the same. Yeah. Actually, like relatives. Point, uh, Ebola was linked to bats as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are able to look at our environment, screen the bats, and then understand whether the virus they have are similar to Ebola or not. Now, this is a kind rat. A rat that is commonly, many communities eat it as a delicacy. Mm. But next to it, this one, is a rat that was brought by colonialists to control weeds in Kenya. It's called Koipus. It, it, it stays in a, a muddy, marshy area, that's why it's the feet are a little bit webbed. Mm -hmm. Different from our indigenous, which is on dry grassland. Mm -hmm. You can see the difference? Yes. Yeah. And the, the piece of paper you see here is what contains the summary information. When it was, what the name is, when it was collected and collected by whom, and then the number. That unique number is like ID is captured in a catalog which has got expanded information inside there. Porcupine. And this is, cre this, is cre this is crested. What does that mean? This is crested because it's behind the head, it's long hair. As opposed to its close relatives which has no hair at the back but has got uh, something that looks like wheat and the tail. We call it brush fur. This one. If you know rattlesnake, rattlesnake that seems to have something like this. You see, this is like wheat or barley? Yes. Yeah. So, so we have these different types collected in different areas and different sexes all together combined to give you what you call the distribution map or the atlas of animals in Kenya. Unique from the two that I've showed you are the flying squirrels. The only mammals that fly are bats, yeah. but there are also flying squirrels and I know many people don't understand where in Kenya you may be able to see a squirrel that has got some sort of wings and flies from one tree to another. The reason why they're not called true flying mammals is because when they leave one tree to another, they cannot change direction and come back to the branch. Oh. Once they take off, they have to continue. They can also not gain altitude. They can only descend or go straight. So they actually glide. We've um, I've presented this in a way that people can understand in the public gallery. So if you visit the mammal gallery, 
you understand this natural history of mammals. So welcome to the world of um, flying squirrels. These are the hands, these are the legs, and between the hands and the legs, a membrane just grows from the wrist, actually almost towards the, the elbow, all the way to near the knee. For the bats, it starts from the last digit. The membrane grows to the last toe. This guy is just somewhere after the elbow, down to near the knee. This membrane is not supported by musculature that can make it flap. Yeah, so it's a zinkery. It has got scales on the, on the tail. So when it's climbing the branch, it wraps on the stem or the back of the trees. It can slide back to help them keep on keeping on. So where to see these guys? These are collected from Western Kenya. Kakamega, North Nandi, South Nandi Forest are the only place in Kenya you can see this. Allow me to show you the bat. And um, I'm glad we're starting with this because I want to connect this to public health. The specimen of bat, and this is uh, Tadari da Pumila. So this is how we preserve some of them. They are dry, they can stay for long. The group of bats that we have here, uh, one of them is mops, which I will probably find down here. Recently was found to harbor a virus similar to Ebola virus. Actually, it's Ebola virus called, um, let's keep it simple, it's Ebola virus. It's only that it is not the same species of Ebola virus that causes Ebola virus hemorrhagic fever disease in West Africa. Yeah, the genetic materials is comparable, but this one doesn't cause disease. Yes. So we know that bats have viruses that are similar to the one causing problems. Now with the COVID-19 virus, we know viruses can change formation and become more virulent, causing more disease and causing more death. So it's good to take note that there are other viruses similar to Ebola virus, even though they don't cause any problem today. You never know, they can change direction of evolution and uh, become more virulent and disease causing to human beings. So how bats live with them is important for us because once we understand that, we can be able to use that kind of information to know how to protect ourselves against virus. But more importantly, the, re the reason why COVID-19 vaccine came quickly are many, but one key factor that people really talk about is the genetic material. So once we identify a virus, we keep the genetic material in that information. So people who develop a vaccine try to play around with it and see if vaccine can be developed with it. So a prototype is already waiting somewhere. Should it emerge to become an issue, they use the prototype to just finish the job. Oh, Nobody talks about it, but that's the truth, yeah. So being able to understand our background, what mammals do we have, what viruses do they have, and all the genetic materials that are in them is important because it's, it takes you from the groundwork of trying to look for the materials to develop a vaccine. Now, when we have got questions that the skins can answer, similarly, we have got scientific questions that the bones, including the skulls, do answer. And uh, when you have a glimpse of the skulls and sometimes you see the horns, you see the kind of weaponry that these mammals do have. They can't manufacture guns, spears, arrows like human beings do. They rely on their natural materials. It could be teeth, like you've seen on a warthog, see this one? Or very sharp canines, like you've seen from a lion. And each Material like this has got information that links it to the skin that you've seen above, or the organ that you could be having in the freezer, or any other material that could be elsewhere. 
Museums exchange materials for comparative mat uh, reasons, and some of the materials that we could we could see linked to this specimen could be lying in Europe or in America or any other parts of the world where we have got exchange agreement. But basically, any animal that has bones and has ever lived in Kenya is represented here. In details that help us to ask questions about past, environment, present, and can be predictive to help us answer what kind of env environment do we foresee, what kind of body changes do we foresee in those animals, and we can use that to infer what might happen to us as human beings. We are using this kind of collections to predict hotspots for the next emerging disease, hotspots where environment is changing quickly, and uh, hotspots where human survival in terms of livelihoods would, could be. One of the most outstanding work that um, I'm doing here, we discovered a rat, the size of a rabbit, about one kilogram of weight, that uses poison from plants to protect itself. Yeah, a herbalist of some sort, <laughs> or a juju animal of some sort. It takes the poison of arrow poison plant. Arrow, arrow poison plant is a plant that Africans have used for millennia. They use the poison put on the blade of the uh, spear or of the arrow, and when they shoot down a, an enemy or a prey, the prey or the enemy will come down quickly within five minutes, I, it, 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 irrespective of how deep the blade went into the, into the system. Now, the rat is using the same poison, and because it doesn't have the technology and tools to handle, it chews it, instead of swallowing the poison that comes out of the juice, it puts it on its coat, on the skin. And the skin has got hair that specialized for wicking it in. I don't know whether you're used to, you know, the lambs that uh, people are calling koroboi. You have a, a, mm. a piece of cloth put inside there, and, and then you're paraffin in the tank. Yeah. And then the, the the piece of cloth will wix the paraffin, and when you put the flame on top, it will just, Light. yeah, same thing. So the hair on the body of the rat, juju rat, for lack of a better name for this, <laughs> will suck in and keep the poison. So if you're coming in to eat it like a jackal or a mongoose, it will, you'll, have to mouth fast the poison and uh, you will be either maimed or killed. So we discovered this, this very recently and we've formally published it. And now we're busy mapping where the rats are and where the plant is. We see that they coexist throughout the, the range of the animal. <laughs> Douglas here from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, we're about to head into the National Gallery of South Africa uh, to see some of the items in their collection and celebration and in preparation for this year's Wikimania 2021. Let's go, check it out. Give you guys some uh, understanding of where the National Gallery is in relation to the rest of Cape Town. It's here in the city of Cape Town, in the city center, in Company Gardens. Uh, right next door to the National Gallery, or uh, and in the company gardens, is the South African Parliament Buildings. That is the back entrance of the South African Parliament over there. Here, right in front of me, is the National Gallery, uh, looking quite, uh, quite, quite nice. And then right next door to the National Gallery, also further into the company gardens, is the South African Jewish Museum, right, right behind those trees over there. Uh, behind the the mural of the elephant. Great, let's uh, let's go in and have a look. So 
So here we're standing in the gallery atrium, which is an extension of the installation that we have in room one um, by Coral Bijou titled Dreams as Revolution. And Coral's work really in this installation is looking at um, human behavior through, I suppose, the metaphor of single-use plastic. And <laughs> The exhibition is less, uh, is more commentary on human behavior than it is uh, a, a kind of celebration or commentary on recycling. And it tries to move away from the understanding that you can sort of change um, the impact that we've had on the environment by changing our behaviors, but rather think of other ways of being human um, and think about the ways that we exist in the world. So the use of single-use plastic, um, is transformed into all these objects and coexists with plant life as a way of thinking through how the organic and the inorganic, the relationship between the two, but also how the organic can sort of teach us new ways of being um, mm -hmm. and allow us to dream new ways of existing um, that might have a better impact on the world or might not, but to really sit in the space of dreaming. So the idea is for there to be this ongoing planting of dreams throughout the run of the installation. And the artist first created this installation at an abandoned nursery on the UKZN um, Belleville campus. And I think the translation of this installation from a space that was a nursery um, mm. and how a lot of these objects had uh, plants growing in them and around them and through them and how they then come into a gallery space and it's a very different interrogation of site and space where we're thinking through kind of like the colonial history of the building of the National Gallery itself but also the past that exists beyond that history that this land actually has a history beyond its colonial takeover and that we can reclaim it in sitting in the space of dreaming. So I think it's really interesting to have these kinds of installations alongside our collections and that is one of the significant reasons why or one of the one of the things I enjoy really about the fact that we have a dynamic program at the gallery and we move away from permanent exhibitions to having an ongoing rotation of temporary exhibitions because that allows us to have works that are in conversation not only with the collection but the history of the institution in ways that the collection sometimes isn't able to do as succinctly. And I think Coral's installation in the space has definitely done that in also interrogating the, the, the relationship between inside and outside space so that the exhibition itself exists outside in the atrium as well as inside starts to also bring up questions about the relationship between the internal gallery space and the internal institutional structure and everyone who exists outside of it and how access is managed and mediated. Yeah, so this is Dreams as Revolution and this is where we come to dream. So it's in progress, the site is in progress. It's never quite final, never finished. And there's an ongoing program of gardening in the space that continues to grow what the installation looks like. So what you come and see on one given day might not look the same when you come again next week. Wow, well, there's a lot, a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but three, three themes really sort of stuck out, for me at least, um, on sort of this, this piece and what you just said about it. Um, I suppose the three themes would be um, first the, 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 the transient or the dynamic nature of the display here at the National Museum, how you're always trying to choose something that's different every time and how this particular display is a nice representation of that because it itself is always changing. Um, and the other one would be um, this sort of juxtaposition between plastic and nature or industry, human-made industry mm. and nature. Maybe there's something there that we can learn. Um, and please do correct me if I get any of this wrong, but this is just the take I home I'm getting. I don't think there's anything <laughs> right or wrong. And absolutely, I think these are all ideas that, that are, you know, instigated by seeing the relationship or the, the yeah, the relationship between plastic and nature or what is man-made and what is natural. Um, I think all of those are there. So it sounds like that's a bit, that's quite an environmental message as, as well, as yeah. a sort of an ex, uh, I suppose a... I mean, it comments on the environment, but I think what it tries to do is, I think what Coral's work does for me is to 
situate a commentary on human behavior within the context of the environment, so to look at what the environment and its current state can teach us about human behavior, as opposed to starting with it being solely like a commentary on the impact on the environment. I think we've, we've had that message repeated to us so many times, and I think that often goes towards the space of, okay, if we change our human behaviors, the environment will be better. But I think if we can sit in the space of understanding the ways we navigate the world as human beings and why our behaviors are structured in that way, whether it's consumerism or mass production and where that comes from within ourselves as human beings, we're in a better position to imagine new worlds that impact the environment differently. Interesting, yeah, and, and I suppose for me it sort of signifies how we as human beings can't be separated from the environment that exists here on Earth yeah. because we are part of a system and we can't live outside of that environmental no. system and even though we try to impose it plastic objects to try and control it. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's... Because we're of the environment, and I think what what we do in the environment is more kind of a, a, a display of the ways we try to exert power onto it, as opposed to us being solely divorced from it, because we are of the environment. And that's a nice segue, actually, to the third thing that you raised, uh, which was this commentary on, on colonialism, in, in certainly in South Africa, but I suppose it could be a commentary on colonialism and elements uh, that descend perhaps not from colonialism or maybe colonial descent from it, which is industrialization and sort of this desire for human beings to control nature and control other things too through, through science or through other means. Yeah, whatever new mechanisms we figure out to exert power and control capitalism as well as a system that is also rooted in controlling the means of production. Yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, all, all types of politics, yeah. socialism is also socialism. controlling the means of production, yeah, and I suppose it also falls in the same, communism certainly falls in the same trap as well in this particular instance. Very interesting. disquieting the domesticities and vestiges of violence exhibition. Um, the works are made from a cellulose fiber and over time they'll begin to degrade uh, and disintegrate, which is also quite interesting because the images reference pieces of European and um, Dutch and Chinese porcelain. So it's quite interesting that something, the reference to something so um, fragile but rather more sturdy and somewhat durable becomes rendered in these cellulose fiber um, sculptural forms that will disintegrate over time. Um, and I think it's interesting to see that process unfold throughout each of the pieces. Fascinating. Why is they why have they focused on um, porcelain and making it out of this sort of uh, paper like material? Um, my understanding is that Lior is focusing on um, the kind of porcelain objects as signifiers of home life, but also within Oops. as having quite a particular reference to colonial history in South Africa. So the home space as a kind of the domestic space mm. rather as a kind of site where the social and political violences and circumstances and conditions converge um, in ways that are I suppose macro but also intimate in because ah. it feels like it's very um, temporary the piece yeah. she's exploring the, the, the temporary it also feels like a strong feeling of decay. Yeah, rot and decay kind of comes through in the ways that the objects begin to disintegrate. And this installation has been up since May, and I believe that by September most of the objects were completely disintegrated. And why, why is she focused on this uh, theme of decay? I think Muir is interested in the idea of bio or what people call bio art, mm -hmm. so the use of um, materials and looking at how materials change over time, 
I think that, but also that looking at that biological decay as a metaphor for, I suppose, the decay in human behavior or society or social circumstances, political organization of and structures of the world is how I've interpreted these pieces. Fascinating. Societal decay to some sense. So uh, this, this piece, I suppose, feels a little bit pessimistic then about society. Pessimistic or observational? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you say that by September or late end of September, it should all um, decayed away. Yeah, so what... So it's about uh, a, a month from a now. A month from now. I mean, already a lot of the pieces that were a lot higher started to... Uh, to collapse. And collapse, yeah. And what the artist does is um, does quite a close documentation of the works at the beginning of the installation um, and at different stages in the decay. So after the objects have disintegrated, audiences will have an opportunity to look at video installations that sort of document the process of, not really the process of decay, but the object at a different stage. Oh. So that's also another translative, a translation from one medium to another, from the sculptural form into video. Interesting. So this will then become essentially a, a video, a video piece. Yes. Ah, fascinating. I like how it's all backlit as well, like an underlit. Yeah, in this dark room, so you really get to see the details um, and the patterns that reference the domestic objects. So porcelain, yes, but I've also seen patterns that almost remind me of doilies and crocheted mm. um, tablecloths and things like that. So you get these patterns that reflect domestic life, particular kinds of domestic Great. Femininity as well. Oh. What you gonna do? Fascinating. garden that we have in the neighborhood and we are going to pick up some herbs. Here is some rosemary, some thyme, and some parsley My name is Tando and I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm a professional chef. I've been doing this uh, for about 11 years. Um, I've worked for private chefs around South Africa. Um, my favorite type of cooking, you know, within the, the fine dining spectrum, I would say French, a lot of Italian, um, Indian is good, um, yeah. Um, the meal we're going to cook today is a beef fillet with palm puree, truffle palm puree. We've got some parmesan, we've got some fresh peas mixed with some bacon, 
some carrot uh, that's been tossed and some honey just for a bit of sweetness, a beautiful jus and some parmesan to just end it off. Hi there, uh, I am Diane, aka Opsilac. I am a Wikimedian, I am a board member at Wikimedia France, and of course I, I contribute to Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects. Uh, uh, I live in Grenoble, you might be able to see the mountains here, we're in, this, in the Alps in France, uh, and I am cooking today with Tondo and I'm so excited um, and with my girlfriend Morgan uh, he'll be cooking with me so we're excited to go. Okay Diane first of all um, have you gotten your potato going and the, the jus the stock for the jus? Yeah uh, the jus is actually reducing right now. Yeah uh, perfect. Yeah and, and the potatoes are cooking they were huge so mm. it's taking a bit of time. I can't have no, that's fine. Pieces. So what I want to start with is the carrot. Mm -hmm. Some baby carrot here. Um, if we could just put our ovens on to 180. I use, I use, um, what is it? C again? Celsius. Celsius. <laughs> So what we want to do is to just, um, we're just going to roast this carrot a bit. Um, how, how we'll roast it and then we'll, we'll get it into the pan and we'll toss it in some honey and get it some, some flavor and a bit of color. So what we want to do is to just get a bit of salt on there and some, some oil for the, for the roast. So if we get, if we get our carrots, we just want to dress them in olive oil just a little and just season them with some salt and some pepper and then um i've got two yes because i'm cooking for one but you guys will have double the amount let's season that and let's get that into the oven on 180 and then we'll keep that in there for about half an hour 25 minutes <sighs> So, the other components. Um, once our potato is ready, we'll attend to that. Uh, can you guys let me know at what stage your potato is at? Prick it with a knife or something. Um, it's starting to be soft. Uh... Quite soft? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's, yeah, let's start with some mushroom. So we've got some mushroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got some wild mushroom here. We have oh, a beautiful. new one. I wish I had those. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what I'm just going to do is these I'm going to leave um, as they are. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to cut my chestnuts uh, just into slices. I'll show you now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to cut this guy just simply like that. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to get a pan and get it sort of uh, quite hot. Um, and then we're just going to toss these in some olive oil. And uh, do you guys have uh, hard herbs like thyme or rosemary? Yes, we do. Awesome. Okay. So let's get our pan hot. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to take some olive oil, actually. Take my mushroom. So I've just got my hob on and it's just a dry pan, just waiting for it to get hot here. Mm -hmm. I'll just move my light. So I've got my olive oil, I've got my thyme mm -hmm. and some garlic that I'm just going to throw in. What I actually like to do is when the pan is hot, I like to just, without even see, uh, get, putting on any oil, I like to just put the mushroom in while like dry pan. What this will do is it'll release a really beautiful nutty flavor. So we just want to heat this a little bit. So after this, we're going to put in some olive oil and then uh, we're going to throw in some, some thyme and then we're going to throw in some garlic and just toss that in it. So when your pan is hot, you can hear it just sizzle a little. Awesome. 
You guys good? Yes, perfect. Okay. Let's get some olive oil in. You can throw some rosemary or some thyme in there. That'll give it some good flavor. Just season it a little bit with some salt. And then you can throw in just a little bit of garlic. We should have some beautiful color forming here. And I'm gonna throw in some butter. I'm usually throwing in like a little piece of butter like this for the amount of mushroom that I've got. But I think yours will be more. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. So right now we've got the garlic in here, we've got some butter, we've got some thyme. Really good flavors coming here. Really good color. Okay. So I'm gonna take mine out. Our potatoes are cooked. Should we uh, uh -huh. uh, take them out and, and filter the, the water? Yeah. yeah. So what you can do, yeah, just take them out and filter the water and we'll keep them there for a few minutes. I'm going to test my potato. Because mine should also be almost done. Yeah. How's your mushroom doing there? Uh... Here is how it looks. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, stunning, guys. And okay, what we want to do next is, I think, let's get the bacon going in the same in the same pan. Um, just still keep it on on just keep the same type of heat. Let me just bring my stuff. Yeah. Um, so the type of bacon I've got, I just bought some normal um, just diced bacon like this. But oh. if you've got pancetta or any type, that's cool. But we, what we want we is, have... is small pieces like this. Hmm. We actually have. What do you slices? have? We no, have that's slices. fine because we can still we can still dice it when it's no. It's that's fine. perfect. Delicious. That's perfect. So we'll cook it whole, and then what we'll do is to just uh, chop it up into diced pieces. But we're also going to need, once we're done with the bacon, um, mm -hmm. is just some, some salty boiling water for our peas, just to get that in. So if we could just get, or well, start thinking about that for after the bacon. Yeah, we're, we'll boil some water. Okay. We couldn't find uh, spring peas because it's not spring anymore here. So we yeah. got beef. Okay. <laughs> We got these? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Uh, I guess it's the same, but... Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll no, see. that's awesome. Okay. Okay, I think the mushroom are ready. What do you think? Okay. That looks good. Let's just set that aside. Perfect. Okay, let's get that hot. And then, and there's still a bit of olive oil in there. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get that, let's get that going. Just put the slices straight in there. I'm gonna throw this right in there. And then you're going to flip it again so we can just get some color out of it and just to get it slightly crispy. I got some crisp there. Yes. All righty. Yeah, I'm going to take mine off. Okay. Now we're going to use this pan again. Mm -hmm. if you can just grab your shallot or your onion. Uh -huh. I, I peel them. Yeah, peel it first. So I've just got a normal baby onion here. Um, don't seem to have shallots at the moment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just peel it and then cut it in half lengthwise like that. Perfect. We're just going to put it flat side down on the heat. 
and we're just going to let it get some color. We're going to char it. So when it starts to get a beautiful black color, very dark brown to black, then we'll take it out. This will also cook the rest of the onion and just soften it slice slightly. Yes. Uh huh. Nice. Beautiful. So it should get like a really beautiful dark color on the flat side. Actually, taking care of the jus. Uh huh. So reducing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that looks good. Should be done very soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a few minutes out here. Awesome. Okay. So far, please. Yeah. I just want some salty water going mm -hmm. on the hob. And what we're gonna do is we're literally just gonna get them in for like 30 seconds. We don't want them to be mushy but we do want them to cook a little and to release some flavor. So they will have a bit of a crunch to them. All right, I'm gonna take my onion off. This is what I've got. And I'll use mainly the center part. Here. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to... Okay. My cat's ready. I think I'll come out. Yeah, but we'll take them out in English, please. For replacements for the peas, but um, Wait, what, did, what did you call it? Fev. Fev, yes. Uh, ah, okay. Isn't it like fever bean or something? I don't know. Okay. Uh, they're beans. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm just waiting for my pea water to just boil. That should be like another minute or so. So when that's ready, when that water is boiling, I'm just going to throw my peas in and we'll just keep it in there for like 25 seconds. Mm -hmm. Not too long, 25, 30 seconds. Normally how we'd cook it is we'd chuck it into the boiling water and then into some ice water. Um, but we're not cooking it that much. How's it going? Starting to soften. Yes. Beautiful. We've gotten our potato done, which we'll get to now. Now we're about to do our peas. Our carrots are waiting for us. Our mushroom is done. Um, and the bacon's done. All right. So do we have boiling water for the peas? We do. Okay. Let's just chuck it in for about 30 seconds. Straight in. So we'll just let that chill in there for about 30 seconds and then straight out. Okay, I'm gonna take mine off. And back in here. So the reason we're not fully cooking them is because I do want to toss them with the bacon before we plate it, just for it to catch that flavor and just for us to warm the food a bit before we eat. Uh, I'm gonna go back to my station so we can get some potato going. Okay. 
Okay, so my potato is done. I'm just quickly going to peel it. And what I have, I don't know if you guys have a squeezy bottle or some kind of a Ziploc mm -hmm. to put the potato, to put the puree in. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me just peel quickly here. It's also good to do it while it's still hot. Mm -hmm. I'm just passing my potato through the sieve, guys. Well, it's still nice and hot. How are your beans doing? Yeah. Get that on there. Awesome. I'm nearly done. I'm good here. I'll just wait for you guys. What I have here is a really beautiful, fluffy potato. What we want to do while this is still hot is get some butter in there. Just get it between your fingers. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, while the potato is still hot, let's get some butter in there. You can break it up also. So I just threw in two little cubes of what I've got. Once it's in there, you can start mixing it and it'll start melting almost immediately. What we also want to do is just a pinch of salt on the potato. I couldn't... Uh, find real truffles, so I've just got a bit of truffle oil here. Mm -hmm. And I'm literally just gonna put in like half a teaspoon of the truffle oil in. So it should look really smooth and really fluffy. It does. So once you've mixed your truffle oil in, we can just put in just a swig of milk. How much milk? Uh, just uh, about, I would say, two tablespoons, let's say. Not a lot. We don't want this to be too runny. So it's getting a bit softer. Mm -hmm. It is. And before we put it in the bottle, mm -hmm. taste it. Just to make sure that yeah. we've got the right thing going on here. It's good. The right amount of salt. You can taste some truffle. It's creamy. Good stuff. So this is what mine looks like. Just white and fluffy. Yeah, looks like yours too. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. So what's next? All right. Next, we're going to put it in our bottle, in our squeeze okay. bottle. We have this. Awesome, guys. We're doing well. I think that's good for me. We are almost ready to carry on. I'm going to set my potato aside. I'm all good there. Okay. Now, we're almost done. Mm -hmm. We want to get our uh, carrots tossed in some honey, some butter honey. And then we want to get our meat going. So I've got a really big piece here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. 
So what we want to do is just to get some salt. Cover the whole surface with your salt. Mm -hmm. On all the sides. Yeah. And then get some pepper on there. Get it all around there. Right, so our cooking times are gonna be different, mm -hmm. but I will be with you. Let's get some olive oil on there. And then, and then what you wanna do is to get your pan really hot, really, really hot. Because if it's not hot, we're gonna put these steaks in and they're just gonna boil. So we want them to really touch the surface and to really catch some heat. All right, so let's just give that about two, three minutes, let that really get hot. And then we'll get our beef in there and fry that. In the meantime, what you also wanna do is just on low, just to get your jus just warming up because you don't want any cold, fatty jus on your plate. So just put that on low until, until we plate later on. When our pan is hot, let's get our beef in. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we'll come back to the yeah. carrot. All right. It's getting hot. It's very hot? It's getting, yeah. yeah. There is some. Okay. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, mine's almost there. Mm -hmm. Once it starts steaming, you'll see it's sort of steaming on the side. Yeah, it's steaming. You know, it's almost like good to go. Yeah. Just uh, one side and then we'll flip it. Uh, you want to cook it evenly. So one side first and then we'll flip it halfway through. So yours can cook about one minute of 30 on each side, depending on how you like it. How do you guys like your steak? And I'm going to get mine in. Okay. So if it's like one minute, 30 seconds on each side, that'll be sort of medium rare. Mm -hmm. well, some nice heat. Uh, what we'll also need for this, if you want to just throw in some butter, the butter will burn, so it'll also help with that charring look that you want on your steak. Yeah, that looks good. Should we take it out, I think? Yeah, take it out and uh, put it on a plate and let it rest. So I'm going to do it in the same pan that, as I've got my steak because mm -hmm. it's nice and hot and the steak will take way longer to cook. So what we can do, just a knob of butter, straight in, let it melt a bit. Oh, honey. So that's going to start to melt immediately. You want to get your honey in. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of that. And sort of just mix those two. And then let's get our carrot in very quickly and just give it some color. You'll start to smell the honey burning or caramelizing, let me say. We literally want this in for like a minute or so. I'll take my out. I'm gonna take my honey out before it burns. It smells awesome. And it looks good. Awesome, guys. Okay, so my meat is going. Okay, in the meantime, you can get your plate ready. Because mm -hmm. we're gonna plate soon. And we're also gonna warm everything up soon. We're just gonna toss everything back in the pan so that you guys don't need cold food. So I've got my character, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Some beautiful color. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Whoa. Really nice and caramelized. Mm -hmm. So just uh, get your station ready, your plating station. You want it to be nice and clean. Get your plates ready. And uh, 
so we're ready to go in a few minutes. Uh, we've got our bacon. Mm -hmm. So let's get our bacon in. Let that sizzle a bit and let that release a bit of fat. Are you happy with them? Okay. Get our peas in there. Not for too long. We don't want them to burn or anything. Just chuck the peas in there for no more than like 20 seconds. Let that, that fat really coat it. Mix that through. Right. That's good. So I've got uh, bacon and pea mix here. Of the onions. Uh, you can you can just get that back into the pan and get that warmed up. Yeah, starting to get, be a bit hungry. So it's <laughs> we can get our mushroom back in. Just toss that through. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting mine in there. Just for a few seconds, just to get some heat on them. Quite good. I'll take mine off. Did you guys uh, get uh, parsley? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so this is a very quick, and you've got a blender? Uh, yeah, a uh, vertical one. Um, stop. Okay, so this will take literally like 30 seconds to do. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to get a beautiful, tasty, very herby green emulsion like that. Mm. Yeah, see? Um, okay, so what you want to do yeah. is take like a handful of the, of the parsley and just quickly run it under some like boiling water. Just you can go to your tap and run, the, run, run it under hot water. What that'll do is that'll release the flavor. Mm. So once you've done that, just yeah. get it into the to the blender. Just mm -hmm. a pinch of salt and some oil. I'd say about half a cup of or a quarter cup of oil. So maybe four or five teaspoons of oil. Okay. And then just blitz that until it's really beautiful and green and smooth. We're ready to plate now, guys. Okay. What we want to do is to start with our potato. We want uh, three really good sized dollops uh, on the plate, and then we'll sort of work around them. Three beautiful dollops. Get my board. Now take our carrot. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice mine in half. Uh, you guys can just put them as they are. Yeah. Then that's perfect. Okay. I want to take our mushroom now. Mm -hmm. And just uh, get it around the plate. You can take your onion. And you can either use a whole, I'll uh, just wait for you. Yeah, go ahead. So you can take your onion and you can kind of use it whole or mm -hmm. take a petal and um, just rip that out and use that. Mm. Or you can mix it. This way. I'm going to take a petal and just sort of lay it very randomly. On the side there, I need to keep some space for our beef also. What's nice about these petals is that we can put some herb oil in there for the plating. And uh, let's get to the courgette. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got this one. I think mine's quite different from yours. I think I saw like quite a yellow one. Awesome. So just with a peeler, we're just going to peel slices like that. Uh, three per person would be good. You want to use quite 
quite thick ones. So once you get to the middle, those are quite good. So what I've done is just roll it around my finger. Yeah, that's perfect. And then just put two or three, just for a pop of green around, around your plate. Okay, let's get our pea and bacon on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you've got a, a, a full spoon, you wanna take maybe just half of it, Mm -hmm. or you can take a teaspoon and just sort of put them around just random blobs of it around the plate perfect i just put my meat on my chopping board here mm -hmm. yeah cool all right i'm gonna slice mine Beautiful. All right. So I've got a beautiful medium rare, medium steak there. Very good. Very good. Very nice. nice one, guys. Okay. I've got my herb oil here in my hand. If you guys have any liquid in yours, or if you just want to put the blobs of the herb around your plate you can do that depending on how it came out mm -hmm. um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to put mine in my petal just fill it there and let it hold some and let it spill out and then i'm just going to put some randomly around the plate you'll appreciate the flavor mm -hmm. Have a stunning, nice, silky zoo here. Okay. Just let it drip off there and let it go where it wants to go and get a bit more just randomly around the plate. You guys happy? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you guys want, just um, grate a little parmesan on the other corner of the piece of meat, just for a bit of effect. Not too much, just a little. So with whatever herbs you have, let's just finish off the plate. Just get them around the plate very randomly. I've got these guys bring a little more green to the table. I'll try and find another color. Sorry, yeah, um, no. Nope. I'm trying to tell you now. <laughs> Oh, nice, guys. Yes. Oh, it looks really good. And I've got nice blue plates. Well, guys, thank you so much for cooking with me today. I really hope you learned a hell of a lot of stuff, and I hope you enjoyed cooking. Um, here is the dish. Please enjoy. Bon appetit. Thank you very much, Sandos, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, this is probably going to be amazingly good. So I'll tell you, uh, it looks awesome and I'm sure it will taste awesome. Uh, have a great Wikimedia, everyone. Enjoy. Bye bye. And I will let the bird have her dinner too.